And if you could please turn to your Bibles, we're going to be reading from James chapter 4, verses 13, all the way through to chapter 5, verse 20. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show, let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbour bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. Have I started from the wrong verse? I was just thinking, I don't remember reading this <laughs> this morning. Let's take two. Okay, chapter four. Thank you for being, uh, not saying, Vanessa, wrong verse. Let's start again. Chapter four, verse 13. Boasting about tomorrow, that's more familiar. <laughs> now listen. You who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there carrying on business and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. And as it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes and all such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is a sin for them. Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your cloths, clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. And look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. And you have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. So be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. And see how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop patiently, waiting for the autumn and the spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near, so don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door, so brothers and sisters is an example of patience in the face of suffering. Take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord, and as you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. And you have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen that the Lord finally brought about the Lord is full of compassion and mercy. And above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven, nor by earth, or anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no. Otherwise, you will be condemned. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. And it is, if anyone is sick among you, let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith, it will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up and if they have sinned, they will be forgiven. So therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. And the prayer of a righteous person, it's powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being and even as we are, he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. So my brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Vanessa. Thank you for reading that. And uh, we are in our, uh, the last of our series um, in the book of James, and we're going to be working our way through that passage. Now, to start off with, who knows what this is, uh, this picture? Um, who knows what 
what this thing is. Can I have a quick show of hands? Just to flush out all the engineers and, and builders among us, that's good. Okay, this is called a Gantt chart, okay? I'm getting nerdy this morning. Um, this is what project managers use to, to plan out, to schedule all of the tasks of a project um, and, and the order in which they happen and how they're all connected. It's very, very useful, very important thing. Okay, here's my real question. Who has made a Gantt chart of their life? Hands up. All right. Gantt chart of your holiday, Gantt chart of your renovation. Am I literally the only person who's done this? Okay, <laughs> there we go. That didn't work out as I had planned. <laughs> They're so helpful. We'll, we'll do a ready course on Gantt charts uh, in the future. Don't worry. But even if you haven't gone to this extent, uh, you're not as much of a nerd as I am, I'm sure that you've done this. Plan the future. Plan when you're going to do it. take your holidays. Uh, plan what's happening next in life. Plan out a project. Uh, we, we, we think about the future all the time. And the end of James, as we just uh, read, it feels like this random collection of stories, but I think the thing that binds them all together is uh, that they are all about how we approach the future. How we approach the future. That's the uh, key concept in this final section of James. And typical for James, it comes up in very practical ways, but the thing that lies underneath them all is, is how we think about what's ahead. Uh, so I want us to say three key things about the future. Um, here on the screens, the future is not in our control. We will face judgment. The Lord will return. Those three things. And then James is going to finish uh, there with eight verses uh, kind of about prayer, and it feels like he's kind of moved on to a separate topic, but what I want us to see is that, that prayer is deeply connected to how we think about the future. So that's where we're going. So let's dig in. Uh, firstly, the future is not in our control. Uh, the, these first two sections start with a new kind of introduction here in James. He says, now listen. Uh, now listen. He sounds a bit like me when I'm talking to unru unruly children in the Hunt household. Like, now listen. L listen here. And I think it's actually got that vibe. That is the exact vibe that he's going for. This is a rebuke. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we go, we'll go to this city or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. And the problem is... But this person who's say, saying this, they presume that they are in control. Saying, I'll do this, I'll, I'll do that, I'll, I'll go here, I'll make money. I know exactly what's going to happen. But James wants to say the future is not in our control. He goes on, verse 14, he says, Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Just sit with that image for a moment. You are a mist. It's like the, the mist over a lake on a cold morning and, and it's there in the morning and then the sun comes up and it is gone. The future is not in our control. At one of our previous schools, um, one of the, the school families, um, they, uh, part of the school community, they went to bed one night and in the morning uh, the wife simply didn't wake up. She died in her sleep just completely without warning. And obviously we can't imagine this, the devastation for that family. But as part of the school community, the, the thing was how much that, that shock of that just reverberated through the whole school because it was this reminder that we are not in control and we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow and we don't know if our investments will make money and we don't know if a bushfire will threaten our city and we don't know if we'll wake up. James says, you are a mist. And it is this key thing that we must understand about the future. 
And so James needs to, to talk to these people who are making all these plans, and he says, look, your plans are actually evil because they are arrogant. It's not that there's something wrong with planning, but that you are planning with, with it, without any reference to God. You think that you're in control of the future, and you're not. You can't be. Now, we do need to plan. It is, it is wise, you know, gant sharks exist for a reason. You, you have to think about the future. So, so what should we do? James gives us the answer in verse 15. He says, instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. We still plan, but we need to draw God into the picture. Uh, acknowledge that God is in control. Now, I don't think that James means that we should just kind of tack a Lord willing onto the end of every sentence as if that's going to magically do the trick. You know, what are you doing tomorrow? Going out for pizza, Lord willing. It's like, <laughs> I don't, that's not the vibe. It is about the attitude. Know that you are not in control. The Lord is in control. He holds the future. And if we know that, if we have that in mind, we will not be arrogant with our plans. And I think that will come out in our speech, in the way that we talk about the future, how we include the Lord in that. We'll say things like, uh, God willing, uh, we hope to start a family in the next few years. You know, the Lord might have other plans. With God's help, I'm, I'm planning to finish uni next year. I need... God to direct that. We will talk like that. That's the first lesson about the future. Uh, we are not in control. The second thing to remember is that we will face judgment. And again, uh, James is rebuking uh, people here who have messed this up. Have a look at chapter 5, verse 1. Again, he gives the little re rebuke. He says, now listen. You rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. See, again, he's, he's looking to the future. He says, you know, right now they're fine. They're absolutely fine. They're, they're rich. <laughs> they're, they're going great. But they don't realize that misery is coming on them. Because God has appointed a day of judgment, a day when every evil deed will be exposed and every injustice will be called to account. And, and when the Bible thinks about this day, it looks forward to it with great joy that it is a relief to know that whatever is happening over there in Israel and Gaza and the things that are, are being perpetrated by both sides, whatever that is, whatever's happening, God will call that to account. And every business leader and every politician who kind of did the dodgy and kind of took a kickback and someone else had to pay the price, that injustice will be seen and punished rightly. And that is a good thing. But James is addressing people who have not taken this into account. See, their, their wealth is making a wonderful life for them now, but it is storing up misery for them later. Because the problem is they've gotten their wealth through injustice. Take a look, verse 4. Look, the wages you fail to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. Or verse 6, you have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. They've got their money by exploiting others, by failing to pay their workers, by taking people to court and kind of ripping them off. And so in the end... Uh, their wealth will actually be the thing that testifies against them. James kind of sets this scene like a courtroom. And it's like the, the prosecution is bringing up all the evidence and, and they're like, look at this gold. Where did this come from? I call to the stand, one of your workers. I'm going to cry out against you. And he says to them, understand the future. We will face judgment and I think uh, we, we need to think through how we apply this 
to us because it's a tricky one. We might not be directly exploiting people through our, our businesses, getting profit off the, off the misery of others. But if we are people who know that the Lord is going to judge, then we must be a people who take justice seriously. And it's difficult. We live in a world full of injustice. And so we need to ask ourselves, I think, difficult questions in this area. I'll I'll frame it as a question. How, How much of our wealth comes from the unjust treatment of others? Think about the clothes you wear, the tech you buy. How much of our wealthy lifestyle is built on the exploitation of others? I I think it's an important question to ask. It's a tricky one, though, because it's like, well, what options are there? How do we kind of extract ourselves from that? We we live in a, a world economy. But there's lots of ways to kind of dodge thinking about it. It is hard to know, but I think it's worth asking the question. It's worth working out. If, if we do need to put energy in, into working out, you know, what are we consuming? Where was that manufactured? Was it built off the exploitation of others? I think we shouldn't sidestep the question of whether we can see ourselves in this section just because we're not some industrial fat cats. James wants us to understand the future. Firstly, that we're not in control. Secondly, that we will face judgment. And so justice matters. Thirdly, here's how we should think about the future. This time it's not a rebuke. uh, It's a reassurance. Verse 7. He says, Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. The Lord will return. That is the the one ultimate, unalterable reality about the future which we must take into account. The Lord will return. And the thing you need to be, if you know that the Lord is returning, he says, be patient. Be patient. That is, keep on persevering, trusting in Jesus, holding on to him as as the Lord that you follow, clinging to him as as the only saviour. That's what it means to persevere. And James says, be patient with that. He says, be patient like a farmer, like a farmer waiting for the crops to grow, for the early rains and the, the late rains to come. A friend of mine works on a farm up in Delhi, um, and I have to say that he does ride the highs and lows of the weather a, a little bit, but his dad, he is patient. Right? He's, he's been a farmer all his life, and he's just unflappable. And it's actually really cool to talk to someone who, who is just like that. The rains will come when they come. You just have to wait. And he's seen all kinds of seasons, and he knows that the crops grow. You just got to wait. James says, wait like a farmer. Know that it's coming. The Lord will return. Just hold on to Jesus. The thing you need is patience. And patience is the easiest thing in the world. Unless someone is annoying you. <laughs> and then it's the worst thing in the world, isn't it? Like, I'm, I'm actually a really patient driver until there's traffic. And there's, oh, then it's the worst, Right? And that's why James says straight away, uh, he says, don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another. Because we'll annoy each other. We absolutely will. We're all here waiting for the Lord to return and we will sin against each other and we'll hurt each other. And James needs to say, don't grumble. Like the natural reaction is for us to go against each other Uh, to to grumble about the insensitive thing that that person did to me or or didn't do or what they said or didn't say. But when we grumble like that, James says it's like we are saying, I'm in charge. I know what you should have done. And, And I'm the boss here. And we place ourselves as the judge instead of remembering that the Lord is the judge. 
He says, be patient. The Lord will return and he will sort out all of those things. Be patient. But other than that, patience is the easiest thing in the world. Unless you're suffering. And then it's the hardest thing in the world. And that's why James goes on to give the example of Job. Um, Because he knows that while we wait, we will suffer. And that is what makes patience hard. That's what makes waiting for Jesus difficult. Because we face suffering. And there's people here at church this morning who are suffering. And you probably won't notice because they'll still smile and say hello or because they'll be serving you in some way but they will be in pain because they're always in pain because of some chronic illness or recovering from surgery or struggles with mental health. And I want to tell you that because it's a reality and we need to remind each other to to show kindness and gentleness to each other. But also because if that is you, if you are someone who faces struggle and suffering now, know this. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. James says, you know what happened to Job. How how Job waited, he persevered, and how God restored him. And that complete restoration that God gave to Job will one day be yours when the Lord Jesus returns. That is the one thing that is certain about the future. The Lord will return. And so James says, wait patiently. Wait like a farmer. You know that the rain is coming. Hold on to Jesus, even in your suffering. He is very near. Three things to understand about the future that we're not in control, that we will face judgment, and that the Lord will return. And I kind of feel like that's a lot. We've we've raced through a big section of James. That would be enough for us to take in this morning. But I think we do need to to land all this thinking about the future. And so we're going to land in the same place that James does, in thinking about prayer. See, what do you do with an unknown future? What do you do with an unknown future? James says, you commit it to the Lord. Verse 13, is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. See, uh, the problem there at the beginning was that um, this wrong thinking about the future, that that we're in control. And the solution is to recognise that the Lord is the one who's in control and that everything that happens comes from him. Are you in trouble? Commit that to the Lord. Bring that to him in prayer. He is in control. Are you cheerful in heart? Has has the Lord given you joy despite your circumstances? Thank him for it. Sing praise to him. Acknowledge that he is the one who has brought this about. That he is in control. Are you sick? What should you do? Should you go online and consult Dr. Google and uh, see if you can (laughs) self-diagnose? Uh, Should you shake your fist at God and curse him for giving you this illness? No, do the same thing. Recognize that the Lord is in control. Verse 14, is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord who holds the future. Now, um, you probably have a million questions about this section. Uh, I certainly do. Um, See, why do you call the elders? Uh, Are their prayers somehow more effective? Um, Why do the elders need to anoint with oil? What does that do? Um, How does the the prayer of faith make the sick person well? Is is that happening all the time? Is this prayer, is this kind of talking about spiritual healing or is it talking about physical healing? There's a million questions that kind of like tumble out of uh, this single verse. And I'm sorry to say we don't have time to tackle them all this morning. 
But I just want to point out a couple of really important things that continue on this, this thinking about the future. Firstly, um, it can't be that healing is, is just automatic. That if you just pray and you just pray with enough faith, um, or if the elders use the right kind of oil, then um, you're guaranteed to get better. I think James can't be saying that. He has just said that your life is a mist. You know, he knows you won't be healed forever. And we don't know what tomorrow will bring. He's already rebuked these people for, for presuming that they will know. So it can't be that there's some kind of automatic healing. And it's the prayer that is offered in faith. Uh, we do it. We, we pray trusting that the Lord will do what is good and right, that he is the one who holds the future. And we should also remember that as we, we pray for, for healing of various kinds, that God may answer that prayer through very ordinary means. That if surgery heals us, then that is God answering that prayer. Amazingly, in control of everything. If a new drug gives us another 10 years of life, then God is over that as well. That is him answering our prayers in exactly the same way. He's in control of medicine as much as miracles. We need to remember that. Secondly, uh, James, as he talks about prayer, he gives us the example of Elijah. And I think that helps enormously as we think about prayer. Uh, it's in verse 17. It says, Elijah was a human being even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Uh, to start with, James points out that Elijah's just like us. has the same limitations. He didn't control the future. Uh, but what does Elijah do? What does he pray for? He prays for the weather. And it's a great example because it's clear that he's not in control of the weather, right? That's not something that he has any influence over. But he prays to a God who does hold the weather in his hands, who is in charge of it. And I think James wants us to see that prayer is effective because God's in control, because it doesn't depend on us. Prayer isn't just, some, isn't just psychological for us, that, that when we pray we feel better about the situation and that somehow helps. It's not like meditation. We pray to a powerful God who is powerful to act. And that's why we pray for sickness. That, that, that's, that's true of everything though, isn't it? That, that he is, is powerful and in control of everything. Who controls the weather? The Lord. Who is in charge of your sickness or your health? Who's in charge of medicine? The Lord. Who controls your friend's heart and the decisions of our Prime Minister? Who is in control of whether a bushfire will start or whether we will wake up tomorrow? The Lord. The Lord who is full of compassion and mercy. The Lord who will return to judge and to bring salvation to all those patiently waiting for him. And if you know that that is the one thing that is absolutely true about the future, that the Lord will return and that the Lord will judge then the final verses of James, I think, really come into focus at that point. And it finishes in verse 19. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their ways will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. We need to help each other to persevere. That's what James is saying. He finishes by, by encouraging us, pray for each other. Confess your sins to each other. Uh, gently call each other back to the Lord because the Lord will return. James is practical to the, to the very last verse, isn't he? Gives us something to do directly after this service as we talk to each other, to encourage each other, to hold on, to persevere in Jesus. 
practical to the very end, but eternally practical because he has the end in mind. What do you do with an unknown future? With all, the, all of its troubles and joys and sickness, with all of its sin and stumbling? Well, you hold on to what you know. You hold on to the truth that the Lord will return. The Lord who is full of compassion, full of mercy, and you hold on to him. Let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you this morning for that reminder that you are full of compassion and mercy. Father, please hear our prayer this morning for those who are sick among us. And silently now we even bring before you those we know who are sick and struggling. Father God, by your power, we pray that you would bring healing. Loving God, where it is your will for us to face trials of many kinds, we ask that you would please give us patience. Help us to hold on to your son, uh, even through suffering, even when uh, we face the pain of, of, of sin and, and, and struggle between us. Gracious God, please would you give us to one another, that we might help each other to hold on. And we pray ultimately, Father, that you would send Jesus soon. And we pray in his name. Amen.